I'm here today to change your view on one of life's most taken for granted, undercover hero. We produce so much of this everyday substance that it could fill 5,000 Olympic size swimming pool a day. It was the earliest form of medical diagnostics and was pivotal to our agriculture and textiles. It was even deployed in the making of gunpowder in the war. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about urine today. <laughs> Brace yourself. For centuries, human pee was a key component to our day-to-day -day lives. Our European woolen industry thrived because of it, a price commodity that was bought and sold. People even took it to work with them. The demand was so high in the 17th century, the industry couldn't get enough of it from the population to keep up. On the medical front, the vessel that kept urine for health examination was the symbol for medical profession in the medieval times. But the most gobsmacking of all, First World War soldiers knew enough of the power of pee to cover the faces with urine-soaked cloth so as to protect themselves against mustard gas. So yes, I'm telling you, pee saved lives. <laughs> We've gone from a point in history where urine was considered as liquid gold to today, we're so desperate to get rid of it and not even able to talk about it. So before you think I have this weird obsession on urine, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm Peony, founder of a company called Jude. We're on a mission to make urinary health into the mainstream. When I was 14 years old, I suffered from a chronic bladder infection so severe, I couldn't get through a normal day, pain-free, urge-free, and anxiety-free. No doctors, no one would take me seriously because I was regarded as too young to fit the stereotype. So I learned all by myself the types of tests and medication available. I even used the color of my pee as a predictor of my next flare up. So I adapted my whole diet with this and adopted healthy pee practices. And I'm so proud to say today I'm fully recovered. So yeah, I'm a little bit obsessed about this topic because I since discovered I'm one out of 2.3 billion people worldwide also suffering from urinary health issues. And I'm compelled to say this is not just something that's happening out there. It is happening to one in three of us in this very room today. And that is why I'm here to change this. You might already know we have a gut microbiome, which is a set of bacteria in our stomach. Through our research, I was surprised to find we also have urobiome. People with the UTI has a completely distinct set of urobiome profile to people with a different type of bladder issue. But what's more fascinating is that B people with depression also have a very different composition to people without depression within the same bladder condition. So it's exciting to know there are more insights onto how we can actively change our mental health, not just through our gut microbiome, our gut health, but also now our urinary health. The work that we're doing was inspired by the golden centuries when urine was examined with no stigma. We're about to bring a modern renaissance of pee. And in fact, starting from 2020, ranging from behavioral tactics to smart diet supplementation, we have already benefited 20,000 women in the UK. But this crusade that we're on have a few quiet antagonists. They are major consumer corporations that thrive by selling nappies and pads to people to hide the symptom without addressing the root causes. 
this has an effect of normalizing incontinence. And this approach fostered a culture where we are so much more comfortable sweeping this under the carpet than addressing it head on. Is there a conspiracy in this silence? By keeping this conversation in the shadows, it stifled innovation, it slowed down disruption at the expense of our collective health and well-being. There is another silent phenomenon that I also want to expose today which is the woeful lack of public toilets. In fact, in the last decade, 60% of UK public toilets have closed down. On the surface, it seemed a mere inconvenience, but there's something more to it. A nationwide research we conducted revealed three fascinating trends. One, the upsurge in what we called wild toileting. <laughs> Number two, deliberate dehydration. 67% of women, all women in the UK, don't drink enough simply to avoid the need to go to the loo. And third, the worst of all, social withdrawal, staying at home so they don't have to fear and panic about not having toilets. These are coping tactics we resort to. But if you think carefully, they also indicate a broader, hidden epidemic of bladder issues our nation is enduring today. So we've decided to also launch a social experiment right in the heart in Covent Garden in London. And I have to show you this. This is a shimmering golden loo. What we witnessed was nothing short of a revelation. People were deeply grateful coming to our loo, queuing for our golden sanctuary, <laughs> but also quietly confiding to me how the bladders were acting up. The diversity in that queue was also astounding. Young adults, mother with children, healthy looking men, good looking men, <laughs> grandparents, and people with a disability. This just goes to show one simple fact, urinary issues are not just the plight of the elderly. It affects everyone, widespread and common. It is also a little reminder to my 14-year-old self, there's no such thing as a stereotype when it comes to your health, when it comes to demanding better solutions to live a life with confidence and freedom. So there has never been a better time for us to talk about our relationship with pee. I want to give you three home truths today. Can I see a show of hands who have ever done a just-in-case wee before? <laughs> Every time you do a just-in-case wee, what you're doing, you're teaching your brain to allow your bladder to go even if it's not full. So over time, your bladder gets that message, start to send false alarms. The more you do it, the more it reduces your holding capacity. So you hear, oh, I have a small bladder, but actually that's not true. So this action can potentially lead to overactive bladder. The good news is you can actively remodel your brain and bladder relationship. So next time you're thinking of just in case, pause, and listen to your body's natural cues. Number two, which P colors here is unhealthy? If you think completely clear P is your goal, then you're wrong. Clear P indicate that you might be drinking too much water that leads to salt imbalances and just never ending trips to the loo. But on the other hand, if you're at amber, then you might need to hydrate more. If your urine is cloudy looking, red or pink, this might be a sign of a UTI, kidney infection or something more serious. Please go to see your doctor as soon as possible because untreated UTI, like what I had, alter my urobiome and can potentially lead to more serious issues like urinary incontinence in the future. The third question that you might have seen here now, 
Did you know there's a right way to pee? So hovering over toilet seats here is actually, seems like a clever tactic, but it's actually potentially damaging for your pelvic floor and can also lead to overactive bladder because you're not fully emptying. So next time, if you're doing this and you find yourself needing to go to the loo again, that might be the cause. So the right way to pee is what we call the elbow knee wee. Plant your feet firmly on the ground, elbows on your knee. This way you can fully relieve. I want to end this talk with a battle cry. Let's take these conversations beyond these walls. Talk to your friends, your family, your mother, your grandmother about the fascinating piece surrounding facts of pee. Not just a quirky piece of trivia, but as a way to open up this progressive conversation that is so critical to our health and well-being. The time to break the silence and stigma is now. So next time you hear the song, Hey Jude, over the airwaves, take that as a sign to take a sledgehammer over these shameful taboos. Thank you so much.